Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Well, the Allahabad High Court, while issuing an order in a habeas corpus writ petition recently, said that it is disturbing that one should change one's faith just for the sake of matrimony when two persons professing different religions can marry under the Special Marriage Act, which is one of the earliest endeavours towards uniform civil court. The order has come days after another High Court judge had observed in another case that religious conversion just for the sake of marriage was not acceptable. The court made the comments after finding that a Muslim woman had converted to Hinduism and a month later married as per the Hindu rituals. Meanwhile, four states, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Haryana and Karnataka are considering bringing a legislation to deal with cases of love jihad. In this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyse the Special Marriage Act and the issue of religious conversion for marriage. Joining me on the programme today are J. Sai Deepak, Advocate of the Supreme Court, P.K. Malhotra, former Secretary, Ministry of Law and Justice, Government of India, and Lalita Kumara Mangalam, former Chairperson, National Commission for Women. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Mr. Malhotra, let me begin the programme with you first. Let's first try and understand and analyse the provisions under the Special Marriage Act. Uh, Frank, uh, provision under the Special Marriage Act were made in 1954, replacing the earlier legislation and it permit any person to whatever religion he may belong, to whatever faith he may belong, to marry any other person of a different caste, of a different faith, of a different religion, provided there are certain conditions which are fulfilled, and those conditions are laid down in Section 4 of the Act. It says that neither of the party is, uh, has a spouse living, and it is capable of giving consent, that is, it is not insane or it, is, uh, it doesn't suffer any mental disorder. It is not within the prohibited degree of rel uh, relations as prescribed under their law. And in case of male, he is 21 year of age. And in case of female, it is at 18 year of age. In case these conditions are fulfilled, then they are supposed to give a notice to the marriage officer in an area where one of the party is living for the last 30 days that they want to marriage. The marriage officer is supposed to display this notice at a conspicuous place in his office so that people, if any, if anybody has got any objection to this marriage, he can file an objection within a period of 30 days. And they, after considering the objection, if any, then the marriage officer can permit marriage and three witnesses are required to sign the marriage certificate or the register of marriage. Now, why this requirement of notice has been prescribed? Because this is a special law. It basically governs marriage between people belonging to different religion, different cause, different faith. Not necessary that the people of the same faith cannot marry under this act. And the people belonging to the same faith can also marry under this act. But for them, there are special laws available. For Hindus, take for example, for a Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh or Jain, the Hindu Marriage Act is there. For Christians, there is a separate law. For Parsis, there is a separate law. And for Muslims, there is a separate law. If two Muslims are marrying, they marry according to their law. But this special law was made when persons of different faith want to marry. And this requirement of notice was there that any person who feels that the parties don't fulfill any of the requirements which are prescribed under Section 4 of the Act are not complied with. If that objection is there, marriage officer can reject the marriage. Barring that, probably this marriage cannot be rejected and the marriage officer is supposed to register the marriage and two people can living, live separate uh, uh, together. Now, right. look at the provision of the constitution. Constitution doesn't differentiate on the basis of religion, race, caste of any person. So this law, in fact, uh, 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 this law, in fact, gives effect to the provision of the constitution when it permits uh, marriage between the different faiths. I think it is the religious leader or for political or social reasons we are facing the problem of love jihad. And for that matter, the observations made by the Allahabad High Court are very, very appropriate. And even in the past, in number of cases, the Supreme Court or for that matter, many high courts have said that don't go beyond the requirement which are laid down under the Special Marriage Act because Absolutely. Haryana did similar thing. Delhi did similar thing, Rajasthan did similar thing, which were struck down by the courts. Right. So, uh, Ms. Kumara Mangalam, since we are here then, you know, and since we already have 
an act, the Special Marriage Act, which deals with issues of, you know, inter-marriage, uh, uh, inter-religious marriages and, you know, those kind of aspects. So why does this still happen? Is there a lack of knowledge really as far as the Special Marriage Act is concerned? Shouldn't the authorities then promote the act to avoid the issue of religious conversion before marriage? Uh, Frank, actually, uh, what I think is that, you know, the act is, uh, the Special Marriages Act 1954 exists to make sure that marriage between intercaste people and between interreligious marriages are legal and valid. But it, what, what it does not have is any punishment that is meted out to people who force uh, one or the other partner to convert for the sake of marriage. Now, for the, I think this is what people are looking at. Uh, the term love jihad came about not because uh, uh, somebody was voluntarily uh, converting from one religion to another. That is not illegal in any uh, case in India. The term came about because uh, partners, more specifically women than the men, but sometimes men too, were forcefully converted in order to marry somebody whom they uh, from another caste or another religion, uh, and they didn't have a choice. Now, uh, under um, the customary laws, uh, which is perhaps Hindu, uh, Muslim, uh, and other uh, religions, uh, the what is told, what what are we told that you know you can't marry under the Hindu law? It is not legal. You can't go through that seven steps, the seven rounds, the fire, or in Islam, some other reason will be given. So the point is not that the, 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 how do you say, the conditions don't exist for an inter-religious or an inter, inter-faith or inter-caste marriage. The point is that inter-caste marriages, you know what happens all over the country. Uh, I mean, it's terrible sometimes, the fallout, and it's still happening. Even today, even in cities like Delhi and Chennai and big cities, it has nothing to do with levels of education, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as we all well know. And when it comes to interfaith marriages, there are still far too many people who are being forced to convert. Whether one agrees with it socially, culturally, all of that is a totally different point. The point is that no individual should be forced to convert in order to marry somebody they want to marry. And for that, uh, there is no uh, penalty or no punishment under the law. Right. Right. Okay, Jaisai Deepak, let's, let's look at another angle now. See, this is not a new problem. So what is the issue then, like the petitioner too has said in this particular case, if it is done under one's own free will? See, uh, I think if the issue is to address the question of conversion, uh, then there is no point in actually dealing with the question of forced conversion or coerced conversion purely from the standpoint of marriage. And if that is what the government wishes to deal with, then they might as well show the courage of their conviction to come out with anti-conversion laws. As opposed to doing that, to limit the scope of the discussion on conversion specifically to the issue of marriage, it's almost as if uh, we are saying that as long as you convert but not for marriage, then there is no problem. But if, okay. if you convert That's for important. marriage, then there is a problem. Then there is a question that arises. So I believe that the underlying problem, whether one wants to admit it or not, or because one wants to be pragmatic and optically right, I think it's important that the question of religious conversion is at the heart of the question, is at the heart of the issue. Hmm. Now, fortunately, Fair enough. this is not, let's say, a concern that has been raised by one particular community. So early this year, I think in January, the Sairam Malabar Church of Kerala specifically admitted that Christian girls were being targeted and killed in the name of Love Jihad. In fact, this caused quite a flutter. Because all these days it was assumed that there was this was some kind of a saffron conspiracy that people were spreading. But unfortunately for a lot of people, a lot of other people also started admitting the existence of this. Okay, So I would suggest that uh, while the intention behind the proposed legislation seems to be well placed, the idea should be to address the root cause in a more panoramic fashion as much as possible. And now that there seems to be a consensus across the board, cutting across several communities, that there is an issue, uh, I think... Uh, a law that deals with anti-conversion, let's say uh, fraudulent conversion or coerced conversion must be in place. And most importantly, as long as the law doesn't say that you can't convert to one particular religion and is kept neutral in that particular sense, nobody can even accuse that particular law of being unequal or discriminatory or targeting a particular religion. After all, that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. Conversion from any religion to another religion, as long as it happens to be coerced and fraudulent, is supposed to be, I mean, it has to be frowned upon. Now, some might even say, that this is ultimately a question of free will, the rights of independent, I mean, individuals are being affected. There is a fantastic judgment of the Supreme Court on this. 
Reverend Stainless Laws versus State of Madhya Pradesh, and uh, which involved effectively the anti-conversion laws of Madhya Pradesh and Odisha in the 50s and 60s, wherein the Supreme Court has specifically recognized that conversions create law and order issues if they are not of the free will, because at the end of the day, it affects the central question of demographics. A religion or a society or a community is composed of individuals. And therefore, if one individual after the other starts petering out of that particular community, then nothing survives out of that particular community. Take the case of Farsis today. They're barely 60,000. Can you blame them if they want to protect their numbers? You can't. So therefore, I don't see why all of us should wait for, uh, I mean, to suffer the, let's say, the same situation of Farsis, come down to 60,000 and then think of an anti-conversion law. You might as right. well do it when it is, it is possible for us to address the issue. Okay, points taken. All right, taking the discussion forward. Now, since we are here, then Mr. Molotra, let's talk about this as well. So, what do you make of the idea of bringing in a new law to deal with the issue of conversion or most specifically love jihad like the four states have already spoken about, UP, Haryana, Uttar, uh, uh, Madhya Pradesh and Karnataka? Uh, Sai Deepak is right when he says about that conversion is a different issue and uh, love jihad is a different issue. I think these two things should not be clubbed. And once we are talking of the marriage law, because today's topic is more particularly with regards to the special marriage act, <coughs> and the issue arose because of the uh, observations made by the Allahabad High Court. As I said, this law was made particularly permitting people belonging to two different religion or community getting married out of their own free will. So I think so far as love jihad is concerned to stop that or conversion only for the purpose of marriage as such, I think is not the main issue. issue. Conversion is a separate issue and marriage is a separate issue. If you are talking about the personal law, I think one of the alternative which is available to us and which I have been talking on many other platforms also, as in today, if you have different law with regard to marriage, inheritance, succession, adoption, and other personal matters, the possibility is that time is ripe now, then under Article 44 of the Constitution, which talks about the uniform civil code, in case replacing all these law, we bring a uniform civil code dealing with the personal matter of all the communities, leaving aside the religious aspect of it, which should be left to the religion. I think the problem is when we club the religion in the personal matter only, then the problem arises. If we leave the religion aside and for the personal matter for all communities, for all citizens of India, if we make a uniform law under the uh, civil code, uniform civil code, I think most of the problem can be taken care of. Of course, number of times the Supreme Court itself has made observation that the time is ripe when the government should uh, take steps in this regard. And number of PILs are also filed before the Supreme Court for implementation of the uniform civil code. But the courts have said that this is a policy matter on which we cannot give a direction. It is a policy decision to be taken by the government because there are many aspects once you bring in the civil uniform civil code into force, which are to be taken into consideration. And as I said, religion and personal matters are to be distinguished and taken care of separately. So if you are dealing only with the personal matter like marriage, succession, divorce, adoption, I think the much of the problems can be solved by implementing the uniform civil code. Right. Okay. I'll just come to the Uniform Civil Code in just a bit. Jay Sai Deepak, I'll take that up with you. But before that, uh, Ms. Kumara Mangalam, you know, uh, as far as forced conversions are concerned, how big a problem are they? And what is the solution really? I mean, is it is it a social issue or is it more than that? Uh, Frank, to be quite blunt, I think it is much more than merely a social issue. Uh, religion is uh, today also far too much about money, about politics, about several other things which are not normally accepted in public. But the fact is uh, that, uh, as you know also, there are many forms of, unfortunately, there are, uh, religion has also in many ways become too violent in many parts of the world. And um, uh, there is, uh, I mean, you know, there is a feeling that uh, unless we have a majority we, our voices will stop being heard, our communities will die out, our culture, our art, everything will be, will be smashed into smithereens. There will be nothing left of our way of life.
by our i am talking about every religion not just one a particular religion and uh, religion has also become very antagonistic today um the even the word secularism is very misused the original dictionary meaning of the word is that where state and religion is separate but you will see that especially in a country like india state and religion is hardly separate we have reservations based on religion we have reservations based on caste etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, because of the voting the, the, you know the pattern the way democracy is in india how it is framed um it is very difficult for any politician to take that extraordinarily hard step to say that we will change the existing system of something like reservation etc etc minority so called minority colleges and schools have got rights that majority colleges and schools don't have for example and this is true in many other fields of life also the hypocrisy of what is today secularism in many parts of the world is mind boggling uh, i mean this is a different topic actually a very very vast topic to uh, to be discussing here today but the fact is that religion is not just about prayer and one's belief in the almighty anymore or you know the, it's not just a name of the uh, that we call our gods it is not just about our customs our social and religious customs it's become about too much uh, about power let me put it that way and the misuse of religion for power is uh, well it should not be allowed regardless of whichever religion it may be uh, you know uh, that we are talking about and i think that is why uh, what mr malhotra is saying what he is recommending which is actually quite right that um, uh, i think uh, many uh, governments many governments around the world are forced to step in at times and say that uh, democratic values and and we are talking about india which is a democ- democracy democratic values does not mean that any one because of religion or caste is higher or lower if right. we are all to be treated equally under the law it means regardless we are all equal under the law it doesn't matter if you are a vip or belonging to some particular religion or caste etc i know it may be very difficult to implement but at the very least i think uh, it's time that this takes needs to be taken on board and that our law makers uh, look at it in a very serious way without getting swayed by politics so jay sai deepak uh, let's go back to a point that uh, mr malhotra was making about the uniform civil code and you know as far as india is concerned even uh, uh, ms kumar mangalam was making the point about how our di- democracy is vibrant it's very diverse and if you look at our structure itself it's complex and it's 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 really very diverse so in that kind of a scenario can we go ahead with the ucc i think there are three levels of issues that you may want to consider in the backdrop of the uh, specific topic of the discussion one the question of love jihad which has triggered the proposal for a let's say a special marriage act must be largely seen in the context of grooming gangs in other countries to dissociate this particular issue from the question of grooming of uh, let's say women of certain communities is to miss the point and uh, unfortunately discussing this particular issue in india is loaded with a lot of political correctness and too many filters come in the way before you can actually start speaking the truth and facts on this particular issue so one i would suggest that we first look at it from the point of as patriarchal as it may sound safety of women it is important for every community that is a fact okay at the end of the day you judge a society by its ability to commit itself to the honor and dignity of women that is a fact therefore you have to ask yourself what is the impact of in, uh, let's say incidents and acts like love jihad on safety of women point number 1 point number 2 ultimately every community is going to ask itself whether certain members of their community are being targeted if they are being targeted what is the ultimate motivation whether the motivation is money or whether it is power or religion whatever it may be i will simply go on the basis of the effect principle that the community suffers the harm as a consequence of these acts okay once you recognize these basic facts the next question will be what is the solution is the solution coming out with a legislation that protects women who are coerced and who are influenced and who are groomed into getting married into a particular community point number 1 or do you make changes to the special marriage act surgically or do you address the larger question of using religion to influence other communities members and therefore you go after conversion 
Now, the reason why I don't believe that the Uniform Civil Court addresses this particular issue is that the intent of the Uniform Civil Court and the intent of the Special Marriage Act of 1954 are slightly different. The Special Marriage Act of 1954 has to be necessarily looked at with the Indian Succession Act for a, for a very different reason. Why? The Special Marriage Act was introduced not just to promote interfaith or intercaste marriages, but to ensure that the definitions of marriage and notions of marriage of communities are not changed to accommodate these kind of marriages. Therefore, the rights of individuals are protected. At the same time, the rights of communities to preserve their definitions of marriages are also protected. So that's a twin objective. As a consequence of which, you have a separate succession act to ensure that these marriages have access to different kinds of succession rules. Now, what does this tell you? Obviously, there's a relationship between marriage and succession. And if there's a relationship between marriage and succession, is it possible to actually dissociate personal aspects of marriage from the question of marriage itself and the religious aspects of marriage? No. The literature of every religion tells you that personal laws, whether we like it or not, are a direct consequence of the treatment of man and woman and other genders and the, the institution of marriage itself. Marriage is fundamentally something that has a communal aspect to it, that has a community aspect to it, and therefore succession also has a religious aspect to it. Now, the fact that you may want to secularize it using the Uniform Civil Code is a different issue, but the Uniform Civil Code is not going to protect anyone who is going to be affected as a consequence of, let's say, a coerced marriage, an influenced marriage, or forced conversion. How on earth is Uniform Civil Code going to help this particular situation? All right, we seem to have lost the line with J. Sai Deepak there. Let me in the meantime go to Mr. Malhotra. Mr. Malhotra, do you agree with what uh, Sai has just said? No, I think the point made by Mr. Sai Deepak is one of the view which normally people hold, but the other view of it is that when this uh, Special Marriage Act was made, there was an objective of making this particular law because if people from different communities want to marry, probably neither the Hindu Marriage Act nor the Parsi Marriage Act, nor the Christian Marriage Act, nor the, uh, nor the Muslim Marriage Act permitted this kind of marriage because there are certain rituals to be followed and those rituals are not required to be followed under the Special Marriage Act. So at that time also, I think the idea was when Pandit Nehru came out with this idea and because it was found that at that time bringing uniform civil code is not a possibility, therefore this Special Marriage Law Act was brought into force, uh, but was enacted by the parliament with the objective to permit the right or protect the fundamental right of the individual young people who want to marry but belong to different religion or different community. I think from 1954 to 2020, we have traveled a long distance. After traveling so much, I think now the things are much more clear and definitely if we can take other major steps, why can't we take, take this major step also, implementing one of the directive principles of state policy under the mm. constitution and permitting the communities and to have, if you, you can have a uniform criminal law, why can't you have a uniform civil code for right. marriages, for succession, for inheritance? So I am of the view that probably time has come when this point should be considered. Yes, there may be issues, there may be difficulties, and we have to cross all those hurdles. And for crossing those uh, hurdles, I think a wide uh, debate is needed among the people who are really interested in the subject and who can really contribute based on their experience and based on the different judgments which were given by the various courts from time to time. All right, then, uh, uh, Ms. Kumara Mangalam, what's the best way forward? I think uh, there need to be, as Mr. Malhotra has suggested, wider consultations from people uh, who have experience in this field, whether it is with women who are, have been affected by it, whether it is from different communities that feel strongly about it one way or the other, whether it is with jurists and with uh, lawyers like uh, Sai Deepak, etc., who know what they're talking about with regard to the law. Uh, but it needs to be done quickly. Uh, the problem with consultations is that sometimes they tend to go on and on and on and ad nauseum and actually what the action that needs to be taken and we need to do it now quickly because uh, as we can see, it's not just in India, all over the world. There is an upheaval which is taking place, which does not bode well for humanity. I mean, as and, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, um, instead of looking at uh, incipient, uh, almost civil war, we should take note of the point that there are so many differences and 
uh, that exist and that there is so much antagonism and i used that word before that exists between people's communities religions castes etc and uh, come up with something that is not uh, merely uh, you know uh, sort of a dictatorial law but that is both human humane and practical and right. also uh, a law that it can be implemented effectively uh, you know we have very strong laws in india whether it's the rape law or domestic violence law etc etc but it doesn't seem to stop the commission of these crimes so um, we need to uh, perhaps uh, also along with the law we need to make sure that the 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 implementation of that law is facilitated i feel sure. this is very important merely bringing in a law is not enough the facilitation of the law must also be equally a part of all consultations and eventually uh, you know probably be put in place um, at least uh, if not e before as soon as such a law is passed Absolutely. i think that's very important and very urgent true very true and jay sai deepak close the show for us with your concluding remarks my only remark is uh, uniform civil code is sometimes treated as the silver bullet to all the communal issues that india faces i strongly believe that that uh, uniform civil code may be justified for its own reasons but i don't think it letters the central question of communal harmony or disharmony in this country and for that i think truth is the only way forward and coming to the merits of the uniform civil code itself even without getting into the question of religious diversity inter -religious, uh, religious diversity is extremely important so for instance uh, thanks to mr nehru the methaksharization of uh, indian succession law is something that hindus have already suffered and several schools of succession have been junked and discarded thanks to his efforts therefore i don't see why we must perpetuate that particular uh, let's say that uh, mentality further by asking for standardization because if you do that then you effectively behave like a nation state india is not a nation state it is a civilization state at the end of the day which means you have to recognize civilization as a diversity as a reality not just as an academic talking point which means succession laws marriage laws are bound to be diverse you want to behave like a europe you want to behave like let's say united states of america then you might as well discard any uh, pretensions of being a civilization state you are a civilization state you can't use it for the purposes of ornamentation when you come out with a speech but when it comes to implementation of the law you decide to act like a nation state this i think is extremely important and fundamentally i think it it, it is all about how india sees itself as long as it sees itself some, as some kind of monolithic entity which has one language and one religion or even one uh, religious denomination i think it it bodes ill for uh, let's say the rights of a lot of people article sure. 44 and its balance with articles 25 and 26 is something that is rarely discussed i think that needs a lot more discussion absolutely all right on that note then i'll call it a wrap on this edition of the big picture thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us what's coming out of this discussion is that religion today has gone well beyond just faith faith in the almighty and that is something that we should seriously look at and consider the special marriage act addresses the issue of inter caste and inter religious marriages but doesn't look at punishment for forced conversion the special marriage act is over 60 years old and it needs to be uh, looked into yet again and needs to be abreast with the times the time is ripe to bring in the uniform civil code we need to have wider consultation with all the civils all the stakeholders a bigger pardon and then bring in the ucc with that it's a wrap see you again next time